Hi. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not having class today because uh, I got a little sick this morning and I just want to make sure everything's okay. Went for a COVID test, you know, the drill. Anyway, so I'm going to continue from where I was last time. Um, so last time we talked about the first law and, um, and then I did an example of boiling a sample of water and what sort of things were happening to that system that would change its internal energy. And in particular, of course, because the first law is delta U is Q plus W. We looked at the different heat and the different work contributions in, in, that happen when you're boiling a sample of H2O. So we did kind of an overview of Q and W, what the, what the contributions would be. But we didn't do any calculations or anything like that. So what I'm going to do now is um, start to talk about how we calculate these things. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is, is focus on work first. OK. And if I were in class, which would be much nicer than here, <laughs> I would ask you, you know, you know from physics, what is work? And somebody in the class I know would tell me it's force times distance. And that's correct, but it's not correct all the time because this equation, so it's like it, it, you would say F times the change in X, right? The distance, the, the change in X of X is the you know linear distance. Um, so if you move something from here to here, you know, okay. Um, but this is really only true if the force does not depend on the distance. So if it doesn't depend on X. So what do we do, what to do if, um, hold on, did I really record? Yes, I did. <laughs> what to do if the force depends on X, okay? Well, then you can't do it this way because what you've basically got to do is take the force at a particular X, multiply it by the infinitesimal change dx and then add up what the force is at the next infinitesimal and multiply by that change in x dx so um so what would so the the little bit of work right the tiny infinitesimal contribution to the work dw amount of work is equal to the force, if it depends on x, times the tiny little change in x. So I would write it as dw is f dx. OK. Um, OK, so let's make a little illustration here. So in our situation, we relate force to pressure, right? So what is force? Well, we know that pressure is force per unit area. Okay, so that means, you know, F over A. So that means that PA is equal to F. So the pressure times the area that the force is exerted over. Now, why, you know, so, so this is the type of situation that we're mostly interested in. You know, we have some kind of, piston-like container, and, and then we have um, the top of it, let's say, it has a certain area. And let's say it moves a little bit, okay? So this is like showing you that the, you know, this is the DX, all right? It's not just a big heavy top. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's, this is showing how much the piston has moved. And, and so, 
here's your, you know, and here's your guess in here. Okay, so maybe I should have drawn the bottom one first because what I'm talking about here is an expansion by an amount dx where the piston first started over here and ends up over here. Okay, so if you think about this, you know, your, your work dw is f dx, but f is pressure times area. So we have that the infinitesimal work is P A DX, but what is A times DX? What is this area multiplied by this change in X? Well, as it, you know, as it pushes up or pushes down, whichever way, the area times the change in X is the change in the volume. So I'm going to make this P DV. DW is P DV. <clears throat> And so that's our first sort of formula for how for the for the work of an expansion. Now, let's first talk about this pressure here. What is this pressure? Okay. What P is this? So the gas has a pressure, which I could call P gas, which is often just referred to as P. Right? This is the pressure inside, right? It's the pressure exerted by these molecules on the inside. Then we have the, the atmosphere's pressure. We have atmospheric pressure. Which this is the pressure, if you have an expansion, this is the pressure that's being pushed against. pressure the gas pushes against. And we often call it P external. Okay, so it's the outside. So we have P external is coming down this way and we have P gas this way. And you know, that expansion is only gonna happen if P gas is greater than P external. And at the end, they'll be equal. But that's for that's not really what I want to talk about today. We'll talk about that uh, uh, another time. So how are we going to get the, the work? We're going to integrate PDV. And this P is the external pressure because the the pressure that makes the gas do work is the outside pressure, is the pressure the gas is pushing against. So it's really P external dV. So we start with sort of, I'm going to call this a working definition, working definition of work. And I'm going to call it this because we have to fix it later. It's not quite right. We say it's P dV. Okay. DW is PDV. This is not quite right. And we're going to talk about why that is in a little bit. But anyway, when you go to integrate this, you get the work. And this P external, if it's constant, which atmospheric pressure is constant. So we're going to take it out of the integral sign. Um, and so what is the integral of dV? It's, you know, if it goes between V1 and V2, this is going to be P external times V2 minus V1. And this is sort of um, the conclusion that we've come to so far. And now I'm going to tell you why this conclusion isn't quite right. Okay. Um, and by the way, this would also be P atmosphere. V2 minus V1, it's the same thing. Okay, so now the question is, why isn't this quite right? And if you remember last class, I talked about when work is positive and when work is negative, okay? And how we have to look at it from the point of view of the system. 
So in this case, we have that our work is the atmospheric pressure times V2 minus V1. And if it's an expansion, so for expansions, V2 is greater than V1. So this is positive. And of course the pressure is positive. So this is positive. Okay, but to do that work, the gas is doing that work. The gas is doing this work. So from the point of view of the gas, this work has to be negative. because that energy has to either be supplied by the gas or supplied by some heat coming in, it would serve to decrease the internal energy unless there's some input of, of heat or work from somewhere else. So from the point of view of the gas, this work is negative because it, um, because the gas is doing it. <laughs> Um, and if there is no input of heat, for example, delta, the internal energy would have to drop because that energy to do that work has to come from somewhere. Okay, so we're going to have to modify this definition and we're going to modify it just very slightly So we're modifying the definition of dW. Now it's going to be minus P external times dV. So this is a definition for expansion work that we use in PCHEM. OK. And just to show you what would happen if you had a compression, W is minus P external V2 minus V1, this is the integrated form. And this is with a constant P external, of course. And um, if for, for a expansion, V2 is greater than V1, and this, be, this is negative. I should write that out. for expansions and for compressions, V2 is less than V1. Um, I should say here, um, no, that, that was, <laughs> yeah, this, so we have here the work for expansions is minus P external, V2 minus V1. This is negative, of course, this is positive, and this is positive. So it comes out negative, which makes sense because the gas is doing the work. Here we have the same expression. This is negative, this is positive, but now this, for our compression, V2 is less than V1, so that's negative. So this comes out positive, okay? So work is positive. So if a gas, is compressed, we say work is done on the gas and that work is positive, okay? Here, work is done by the gas and that work is negative, okay? So we have work on the gas, compression, work done by the gas, expansion. All right, what about heat? All right, so we got through the first part. Um, so heat, heat is pretty interesting stuff. What about heat? All right, how do you measure Q? That's the, the sort of the other part of the first law. So what I'm going to tell you here goes for processes for that where the temperature changes.
Now, obviously that's not all processes. For example, you could have um, water in the solid going to, well, actually let's make water in the liquid going to water in the gas. And this happens at 100 degrees C, the temperature is constant. But of course, heat has had to be transferred to the system for this to happen. So this is, this. I, you can't use this method for figuring out Q here, okay? So not relevant for phase changes. Okay, that's sort of parenthetical to what we're doing here. So for processes where the temperature changes, so for example, so, so really if you're adding heat or removing heat, resulting in a delta T, okay, that's what we're talking about here. This is not what we're talking about here. <laughs> okay, for those processes, what you would do is you would measure the change in temperature and then the next thing you would do is you'd realize that the heat is proportional to that change in temperature. And of course, um, heat going in is positive, heat coming out is negative. Um, so we have this proportionality. So that means that Q is a constant times the change in temperature. And when you do experiments where you calculate a heat based on a change in temperature, we call this calorimetry. I'm gonna talk about a particular type of calorimetry today, which I call constant volume calorimetry when we get up to that. But actually this, what I'm gonna give you next, um, actually is good at constant pressure or constant volume. It's pretty general. So these are general um, equations. And these are equations you should have seen in freshman chemistry. This proportionality constant um, depends on how you write the equation, depends on whether you use mass or moles of the substance. So if you use moles, you have Q equals N, C, delta T, I'm leaving space because I wanna put in what these mean, the moles of substance. This is the molar heat capacity. Okay, and this is the change in temperature, delta T, we know what that is. Okay, so um, the units of these, well, of course, moles would be moles. <laughs> C, okay, this is energy or joules per mole degree, degree C times the change in temperature in degree C. So why can I use degree C here? Why am I allowed to use delta T in degree C? And, um, yeah, if you, if I would probably, if I were in class, I would ask somebody who had done the chymotrypsinogen lab, because in that lab, um, you use the fact that the change in temperature in degree C is the same as the change in temperature in Kelvin. So that's why you can do it, is because the size of Kelvin degrees and degree C is the same. So delta C, sorry, delta T in degree C is the same as delta T in Kelvin. All right. And there's another way we can write this equation using the mass and something we call the specific heat. And some books in freshman chem, it drives me a little crazy, but sometimes this is called the specific heat capacity. It's like they want to put both words together. <laughs> and then the change in temperature. And so we'd have grams, joules per gram degree C and degree C. And you can see that these cancel out, give you joules. Energy, oops, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> okay. 
meant to highlight it. Okay, and here again, we have a similar situation. Moles goes degrees C and we end up with joules. So we end up, of course, the heat is gonna have a unit of energy. But what I'd like to talk about for a few minutes is this heat capacity. And really what I'm saying also goes for specific heat. It's just that I tend to use heat capacity because we tend to use moles more in PCAM than we use grams uh, when we do problems like this. So um, what is heat capacity? Or, you know, um, what, what does it kind of mean? <laughs> what does it mean? I, And the short answer to that is that heat capacity and specific heat, this, these are measures. So heat capacity is a measure of a system's ability to store heat. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is show you a simple example that kind of illustrates that. So here's my simple example. I'm gonna compare the heating of 200 grams of water versus 200 grams of iron, okay, solid iron, okay? Um, and I'm gonna input 46,000 joules or 46 kilojoules of heat to each of these sample samples. Okay, so my question is, if you input this much of heat, if you input this much heat to each of these samples, here's the question, which would you rather touch? So what am I really asking here? You know, when you put that much heat in these samples, the samples do different things with them. And that changes for, for the different samples, what the change in temperature is gonna be for each of these samples. And, um, and of course you'd rather not touch something that's going to burn you, okay? So if you just do a very simple calculation, like let's suppose, here I told you I use joules and now I, I use moles and now I'm using grams, but that's all right. We're gonna calculate Q. Just check one thing. Q as M, S, and delta T, okay? Now for water, the specific heat is 4.184 joules per gram degree C. For iron, the specific heat is 0.45 joules per gram degree C. You can probably tell this by looking, but let's just you know pretend this is freshman chemistry and delta T is Q over MS, okay, for water. And then we have that the delta T here is Q over MS for iron, okay? And Q is 46,000 joules. The mass is the same, 200 grams. And now we have 4.184 and 0.45. So you could see um, this number is a lot smaller. So the denominator is smaller. So this number is going to be a lot bigger. In fact, since the, this number is about 10 times smaller than this, this change in temperature is going to be 10 times bigger. So it's 511 degrees C, while this is 55 degrees C. 
Well, look at that difference there. It's pretty shocking, right? You add the same amount of heat <laughs> to water. Let's say you started at 25 degrees C and then you add 55, you're going to end up at 80 degrees C as your final temperature. And here, if you add 25, you get 536 as your final temperature. I don't know about you, but I would really much rather touch this one, right? That's why when you're heating your pan up full of water, if it's cast iron, let's say on the stove, you'd really rather touch the water than touch the pan, okay? Because that pan heats up much more, okay? So this is because water is better able to store heat than iron. Yeah, water can store heat a lot better than iron. What does it do with the heat? Why is that true? Water has more places to put heat. You know, what does that even mean, right? <laughs> um, before I tell you, uh, you know, why that is, I, I just want to state for the record you know, that, that substances with larger specific heats and heat capacities, their temperatures will rise less for the same input of heat. And it turns out that water has actually very high heat capacity or specific heat, okay? So why? Let's consider iron versus H2O. Where does, where do, where does a sample of iron put heat, okay? And so in solid iron, you have atoms, iron atoms that are all bonded kind of in an array. You know, there's a repeating. All the way up, up and down, side to side. I'm not gonna draw this forever, okay? You have all these iron atoms. And, um, and those particles, when you heat them up, all they can do is sort of vibrate in place. They can't translate, they can't rotate, and they can't do anything interesting. No translation, no rotation. not really much for them to do. So since there's few places to use that heat, the temperature goes up very rapidly. And let me, this is a big contrast to water. So I'm going to contrast this to liquid water, okay? So first of all, water can translate, rotate, vibrate, and that takes up a certain, you know, smallish amount of heat. But most importantly, what does water have that that iron sample doesn't have? Liquid water has hydrogen bonds. These intermolecular forces, okay? And what happens is that the energy that's inputted, you know, the heat that's put into the system is, can be used to distort 
those hydrogen bonds. Okay, maybe even break some of them. It takes a lot of energy to do that because those are relatively strong intermolecular forces. So those hydrogen bonds, in a sense, distorting them, messing with them, are, are a, something to do with that heat. And that doesn't involve the temperature going up. So, so the energy that's put into the system goes into distorting, stretching, maybe even breaking hydrogen bonds. Um, and since this takes up a lot of heat, since this uses a lot of heat, there, uh, um, the temperature doesn't go up as much. Basically in iron, almost all the heat is used to raise the temperature because it doesn't have anything else to do. But in water, it has all these hydrogen bonds that can be distorted. So the temperature does not go up as much because um, the heat is doing something else, okay? So, um, so that's, that's an explanation of that. Now, as you could tell from this discussion, it seems pretty clear that heat capacity and also specific heat, but we talk more in PCHEM about heat capacity, that heat capacity has to do with how the input or output of heat affects the temperature. Okay. So if we go back to the first law, Q plus W, um, I have to tell you that a lot of times we don't use the first law in this particular form. Lots of times we have to start by looking at small changes in internal energy that come about by, you know, an infinitesimal inputs and outputs of heat and work. So we really often use the differential form of the first law. So this is the differential form. Um, and I just want to say that if you take du and you integrate it between two states, that would be u2, right? It's, so, so, the, so it's actually u evaluated from one to two or u2 minus u1 or delta u. So the integral of du is delta u. That's um, so. So we have dQ. dU is dQ plus dW. Um, by the way, you cannot do this thing where you end up with a delta like this for Q and W. And while we won't totally talk about that today, we will have a, a day when we address the fact that the 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 Q and W and delta U are really kind of fundamentally different in terms of um, how we can write them and how we think about them. I'm going to start to talk about that today, but I'll get more um, definite about it in another lecture or two down the road. I don't want to overload everything from the beginning because I want to go back now to this, to this du is dq plus dw. And I want you to notice if I plug in the expression for expansion work. So I'm really only considering expansion work. And, and that's what we do in the first part of this course, expansion work only. And we know what the definition of expansion work is. It's minus P external dV. So if I put that in, right, I have this equation. Now, what happens if we have a constant volume process? So for constant volume processes, dV is equal to zero. And if dV is zero, then this entire term is equal to zero. And so we end up with du equals dQ. And a lot of times we put a little V here, dQV. 
that's the heat at, that flows at constant volume. Okay, so um, so we can get the change in internal energy from the heat only as long as the volume is constant. And um, and so I would like to, to think about this a little more and say, okay, suppose I write U as a function of volume and temperature, say for one mole. I really don't have to write this as a function of U, V, T, and P because any changes in P, uh, um, there's a, the ideal gas law relates P, V, and T. So I only need to write U in terms of two of those variables. The other one um, is sort of predetermined once you change V and T. So if I U, say that U is a function of V and T, I can write that the total differential DU is DU DT DT. So that's a partial derivative of U with respect to T at constant volume times dt plus du dv at constant t dv. Okay, now look at this. If this term, if volume is constant, then dv, change in volume is zero, and this term goes away. Okay, so that means that I have that du is du dt dt, okay? And um, if you think back, right, if you, here we have du is dqv. Um, so, so this thing here is actually the definition of the heat, what we call the heat capacity at constant volume, with a constant volume heat capacity. So du is CV dt. All right, I have to sort of modify this a little bit because generally CV is usually a per mole quantity, okay? And so for more than one mole, suppose we have N moles. Then I would have to say that this change is N CV dt. Um, and if I integrate this, the integral of du is going to, from state one to two is u2 minus u1 or the change in u. I have to make an assumption here, and of course is constant, but CV, um, if it's independent of temperature, you can take it out of the integral along with N, and this becomes NCV, the integral of DT, from T1 to T2, the integral of DX, right, is X from, from x1 to x2, it's just x2 minus x1 because you're evaluating it over those limits. Just the same here, this becomes NCV T2 minus T1 or NCV delta T. And if you remember what I showed you at the, you know, a few slides ago, a few minutes ago, I told you that delta U is NC delta T. So now I'm getting a little more specific about the meaning of that C. Okay. Um, this is earlier. So delta U, just to put it all together. But we did this for, for delta V equals zero, no expansion work. So we have basically Q is NCV delta T, which is very much like what I told you before. I think I told you this was Q. But now we come to find out that this is actually the change in internal energy. 
So if you have a process that changes the temperature and you've measured the heat using this formula, you've also measured the change in internal energy. And constant volume. So that's really like our first, you know, example of how you measure a change in a thermodynamic parameter. Our first one, the change in internal energy. And this, if this is used in a kind of particular kind of calorimetry, we call bomb calorimetry, believe it or not, which is another way of saying constant volume calorimetry. And in it, we use something called aptly, I suppose, a bomb calorimeter, which is like, whoa, way down here. You kidding me. <laughs> Find it before I go on. All right, I found the bomb calorimeter. <laughs> Let me move this over just a little. Okay. So this is a schematic of it. I'll actually show you what one looks like. I actually will bring it into class, but I'll have a picture of one here. Why is this called a bomb calorimeter? That's because it is this whole, this is generally used for combustion. All right, so it's sample undergoing combustion, which is in this little tray here. So it's generally for combustion reactions, which are release a lot of heat, as you know. Now, what is done is you use a very high pressure of oxygen, you know, like 30 atmospheres or something like that. We used to do this experiment and I always felt as I turned up the oxygen pressure in the bomb, I always crossed my fingers a lot, which is why I don't do it anymore. Okay, so it uses a high pressure of oxygen, so you must have a very strong container. Generally, these are made out of stainless steel. Um, let me show you what it looks like. Here's a picture of it. So you can see there's all these threads here, right? And so you screw this on many, many times. On top, there's a, this is a valve here. Um, and if it overpressurizes, that valve opens and some of the, it releases some of the pressure. This is a little pan, a little tray that you put your sample in. Um, and, it, and this is actually a round thing that holds the sample. You can't see it, but it's actually a circle. Um, and here, what you do is you put a wire. You put a wire from here to here. And when this thing is held upright, let me show you in this picture. Here's the thing, here's the wire. Um, and the sample is in here. And so it's a very thin wire. And when a voltage is put across these two ignition wires, it's, it, it, the wire can't take it, right? It's too much resistance and it forms, gives a spark and it starts the combustion reaction going. Okay, so this is the stainless steel part. And it has, of course, a cover that's not shown here, but it has holes in it, so. And then that whole thing is put inside this, this other outer container here. And then in between there and the walls, you have water. This is filled with water. So that's what that nice uh, blue, blue um, thing is. That's the water bath. Okay, so I'm going to say it's surrounded by water, and you have the sample in the pan, and then you have this the ignition wire. So when you apply the voltage, 
the wire um, basically burns. It gives a spark to start the reaction. Okay. And then, okay, so now you have all this heat coming out of here, all this Q. That heat immediately will go into the water. There's a lot of water there. It's a good heat sink, right? It's got lots of hydrogen bonds that you could disturb. The water keeps flowing. I'm sorry, the heat keeps flowing into the water. And then the temperature goes up and the thermometer is in the surroundings. It's kind of important for something later. Notice that. So you're measuring an increase in temperature in the surroundings. Okay, so since delta V is zero, so no work is done, go down here. We have delta U QV equals NCV delta T. And a lot of times this is just incorporated into a single constant C, right? So we have delta U is C delta T. However, um, I'm going to give you a problem in the next week or two, and it's going to give you a different equation to use for this type of, of situation. Um, and what you see mostly is delta U is minus C delta T. So, you know, why the negative sign? Okay. So, Here's the, here's, the, here's the deal, okay? Here's internal energy on a graph, right? Here's your reactants. So you have some compound plus oxygen as the reactants. And then the products are down here. So this is carbon dioxide and water, products of combustion. This is a downhill reaction, which means heat is released, okay? So that means what is the sign of the delta U going to be? You know, we always look at this from the point of view. What, what's the sign of Q? What's the sign of delta U? You know, delta U is Q. Okay, so this is gonna have to be negative. Heat is released. Delta U is negative. All these are negative. Um, but if we use the formula, Delta U is C without the negative, right? The temperature goes up. Your heat is being released into the surroundings. The temperature is going up. Delta T is positive for a combustion reaction. Unless we put a negative sign here. So we must put a negative sign here. Or else will say delta U is positive and that's impossible. You know, but I'm, you know, I hope that you're not satisfied with, we we'll put it there because it has to be there, right? So, um, so what's, what's really going on here is you have a system. The system is just the burning um, chemicals, the reactants and the products, and there's no way that you can measure the temperature of that. You have to measure the temperature in the surroundings. So the heat is passed into the surroundings and the temperature of the surroundings goes up. Now, let's, let's, let me tell you something that we use over and over again in this class. First of all, Q. Q is the heat from the point of view of the system. We never use a subscript for the system. So Q is 
is negative because the heat is leaving the system, all right? But that is equal to the negative of the heat that comes into the surroundings. Whenever heat leaves a system, it goes into the surroundings. If Q is negative, Q sur is positive. If heat goes from the surroundings to the system, then Q is positive and Q sur is negative, right? So remember that we never use these. We never use subscripts for the system. So if you see a parameter without a subscript, you know I'm talking about Q system. Okay, so, well, you could see what's happening here. This is delta U. Um, but we're measuring this heat in the surroundings. So this is really minus Q, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I say that right? Right, C delta T. Delta T is measured in the surroundings. So C delta T is Q sur. So minus C delta T is minus Q sur, which is Q system, which is delta U. So that's why you have to have the negative. All right, let's see. All right, so what I'd like to do next is talk a little bit about, um, about how delta U, Q, and W, these are all forms of energy, right? But there's kind of a fundamental difference between the Q and the W and the delta U. And this will become even more clear when we talk about um, how you integrate dQ and dW and dU and how you don't really do it in the same way, but I'm only gonna do this a little at a time. So there's a quote I love on page 35 of the book and it says, so I'm gonna try to explain this a little bit by looking at an analogy and it's the bank analogy. So it says a system is like a bank. It accepts deposits and makes withdrawals in either currency, work or heat, but it stores its reserves as internal energy, okay? So what this means is that like a, you never say a bank, uh, you say you deposit money in the bank, a deposit or withdrawal is the process of inputting or outputting money, okay? Money is what's analogous to internal energy. The inputs and the outputs are analogous to work and heat, okay? So you would never say, for example, that a system has work or has heat, but just like you would never say um, a bank has deposits or uh, you would say it has assets, okay? So it has money or it has assets. So basically Q and W are the processes of inputting and outputting internal energy, just like work uh, just like um, depositing and withdrawing are the processes by which the assets or the money in a bank changes. So assets are a property of the bank, just like internal energy is a property of the system. But you, you would never say that um, the system has work or has heat. So the W and Q are how the U changes but um, the system doesn't have those things, okay? They're not the contents of the system. So study that a little bit um, and maybe you'll, um, you know, you'll like it like I did. Anyway, here's a little cartoon I threw in for a little uh, comic relief. I did this for that, for that talk I gave. So why don't you just read it?
right? So these two mobsters are trying to shake down the bank teller, but maybe they're just thieves, right? To get a certain, get a bunch of work or heat out of that bank. Um, but she says, sorry, we're all out of internal energy. So someone would have to either put in some heat or work, uh, some heat or some work for me to be able to have some to give you. Okay, so but what, the, what the bank has is assets. It's like the system has internal energy. So anyway, I tried with that cartoon, but you know, cartoons are not that easy. <laughs> All right, so it's often said that the first law is just some kind of restatement of conservation of energy. How so? I mean, after all, the first law says delta U is Q plus W. How, how is that conservation of energy? So what the first law does is it sort of shows us how to keep track of where the energy is going. So to change the energy of a system, heat or work has to flow in from someplace else called the surroundings. Um, or flow out to someplace else, all right? But the total energy a system plus surroundings is the same. So the first law just kind of shows us how to map out the changes in the internal energy of a system. Um, so, so I guess my main point is to change the internal energy of a system requires Q or W to flow in or out um, from or to the surroundings. It doesn't just disappear. You know, there's an exchange of Q and W between the system and the surroundings. And if it's not in one place, it's in the other, okay? So it is really kind of conservation of energy. Um, there are some I call casual statements of the first law. Okay. One of them that I love is there is no free lunch. But what on earth does that mean? Well, you know, it's all about how you can get a system to do work for you, you know? There's a lot of work to be done out there. So if work was done, it must have either decreased the system's internal energy or heat must have been inputted. That's the only way that that work can be done. There's no free lunch. You're not gonna get work for nothing. If work was done, it means either of two things. Either U decreased or Q came in and was used to do that work. No work is done for free. You must use some kind of energy to do it, okay? Another way to say the same thing, you get what you pay for. If you want to do work, you have to supply heat or decrease the internal energy. It's got to come from somewhere. Okay, the energy has to come from somewhere. Um, by the way, what if you have an isolated system? So here you have a system um, and there is no um, input or output of heat, which means it would be very insulated. Okay, also no work done on or by the system. 
And the kind of work that we know about is expansion work. So we would say constant volume kind of takes care of that, at least um, in, in this case, what we are studying. So Q would be zero and W would be zero. So delta U would be zero. And that's the statement of the first law for an isolated system. That does look like conservation of energy, but it is conservation of energy even if the system is not isolated. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so I have just one more thing I'd like to talk about before the end of this class. Um, and that is some more specifics on calculating um, expansion work. In a couple of uh, simple situations. Okay, so I, I talked about this last time, really. Expansion against a pr constant pressure. So here we have our piston with a nice removable wall. We have our gas down here and we have an external pressure, okay? Now, dW is minus P external dV. This is the definition of expansion work. And when you integrate this, Um, between, uh, you can take, this is constant. You did this already, really. And we have two limits here, V1 and V2. So the work is minus P external, V2 minus V1. So we had this already. Okay. But the new question is, you know, what is the pressure of the gas during the expansion? So when it's when we say a constant pressure expansion, we mean that the external pressure is what's constant. This gas would not expand unless its pressure changed. Let me show you. So here we start. We have our nice little wall. We have our gas in here at volume V1. And we can pretend that the atmospheric pressure is like a weight of a particular mass, right? Sitting on top of this gas. So this is like the atmosphere. Now the gas has a higher pressure. And the reason I know this is because I, I'm setting this up as an expansion and, and, and the only way this gas is going to expand is if P gas, which is this here, is greater than P atmosphere. So it must be true for expansion that P gas is greater than P atmosphere. Why? Because, well, the pre if, if you have a bigger arrow on the inside, a bigger force, then this gas is going to expand until the arrows are the same. Okay, so you really need a pin here, right? You need some strong pins here to keep the wall down because <laughs> it wants to go up, okay? So what, when you remove the pins, the gas expands. And this is what it looks like at the end. So here's the end. So I'm drawing the same, sort of the same container, but now the wall is up here. I still have my same box on top with the same pressure of the atmosphere. That has not changed. The external pressure is still P ATM constant. 
right? That's the same. We have our gas here and now we have V2. At the end, <laughs> the gas is no longer pushing with that enormous pressure. I'll keep it red. So at the end, P gas is equal to P atmosphere, okay? So that means that the second pressure, P2 of the gas, is equal to P atmosphere um, or P external, okay? Um, so the final pressure of the gas in an expansion is always the external pressure. Okay, we call this when we have equal pressures here, we have the same size arrows. Oops, I meant to make that nice color. Right, P external, P atmosphere, P gas. These are equal. We call this mechanical equilibrium. And um, so P2 is P external and V2 is NRT2 over P2. So let's get a little more specific. Um, so the work becomes minus P external times V2 minus V1. Um, remember V1 would be NRT1 over P1. Okay, this would be P gas here would be P1. And now here P gas is P2 is P external or P atmosphere. So this is minus P2 NRT2 over P2 minus NRT1 over P1, okay? So that I could factor out, hmm, no, nothing else. I'm just gonna leave it like that. So, so this is, um, Expansion, expansion for expansion against a constant pressure. Now, I'm going to make this a little even more specific. I'm going to narrow it down to an, a, a special case of this special case. Suppose that we keep the temperature constant. If T is constant, okay? Then we have T1 is the same as T2. We're just gonna call it T. And the work is minus P2 and R just T over P2 minus NRT over P1. And a lot of times this is written in the following way, minus NRT P2 over P2 minus one over P1. Oh, sorry, P2 over P1. So I, I actually multiplied out this and factored out the NRT. So I end up with work is minus NRT, one minus P2 over P1. Okay, um, the P2, of course, is less than P1. So this is positive for an expan, uh, this is positive for an expansion, you know, for expansion. The, the final pressure is less than the initial pressure. Otherwise it wouldn't expand, right? The, the initial pressure had to be greater than P external. Remember we had this diagram here the gas pressure was greater than the external pressure. At the end, the gas pressure is P2, which is equal to the final pressure. So um, P2 must be less than P1. This is positive, this is negative. 
So this work is negative for an expansion. Um, I could, you know, reverse the order in the parentheses and put a positive out here. But personally, I, I like it this way because then I could easily figure out the signs and um, I just, I'm used to it. So I keep it that way. All right. So I'm going to continue more with um, work next time. And, uh, and that's it for, for Wednesday's class. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I'm sure I'm fine. I just was being very cautious. Okay, have a good weekend.